Good evening. And now I'd like to call upon Yosef Wask for words of reflection. We are grateful to Yosef for making available to us the Leonard Cohen artworks exhibited in our gallery until 9 p.m. tonight. Two Eliezers, a singing priest and a reluctant prophet among us. Over the past few months, we have lost two great ones, both blessed with the ancient Hebrew name Eliezer. God is my help. One was a prophet, the other a priest. Although both would deny the title, the two Eliezers were Leonard Cohen, whose Hebrew name was Eliezer ben Nissan HaKohen, and our teacher Eli Ruzel, Eliezer ben Shlomo Vissara. If Eli was the reluctant prophet, then Leonard was the mischievous priest. They inhabited the archetypes of prophet and priest, not because they wanted to, but rather because they expressed themselves so honestly, so deeply, so painfully and hopefully that they were accorded those roles by others. Even though Hanukkah is two weeks away, I'm going to light a menorah to bring us a bit of light in the midst of winter and the world's darkness. A New Yorker article published just a month before Leonard's passing described his modest living quarters during the 1990s when he moved into the Zen monastery. The quote, Cohen lived in a tiny cabin that he outfitted with a coffee maker, a menorah, a keyboard, and a laptop. <laughs> I just received this 200-year-old European menorah from Gina Dumont. It was from her husband's menorah collection. They were both Holocaust survivors, as was Elie Wiesel, who made it his life's work to bear witness. You want it darker? Asked the Eliezers to their god. Ring the bells that still can ring. Forget your perfect offering. There is a crack in everything. That's how the light gets in. Leonard Cohen, born on September 21st, 1934, the autumnal equinox. He came from a lineage of community scholars and leaders who could trace their ancestry back 3,500 years to Aaron, the brother of Moses and Miriam, to Aaron, the first Kohen, the first priest in Israel. I remember seeing him at concert here in Vancouver and sitting there and all of a sudden it dawned on me, beautifully dressed, with his hat on one knee and then two with his hand up and the feeling palpable throughout the room. And I said, this is the real, this is the true Kohen Gadol, the high priest. So much of, I'm, I'm not trying to talk anyone down, uh, of what goes on in so many of our congregations is, uh, feels like, uh, like rote or it's all written in the book and not in the heart. And here was someone who brought out from everyone, no matter their background, the feeling of what a true high priest would be like. One of my favorite Leonard Cohen stories was told by Dr. Marvin Weintraub. Uh, he was living in Montreal many years ago when he heard a, a young CBC reporter 
asking Leonard if he was concerned about his last name Cohen and wouldn't that attract anti-Semitism. She asked him if he ever considered changing his name, to which he responded, yes, I have. To what, she queried. To August, he replied. <laughs> to which, in bewilderment, she blurted out, Leonard August? No, he paused, to August Cohen. <laughs> <laughs> Elie Wiesel, if Leonard was best known for his music, Elie Wiesel was best known for his words. And yet Leonard was also a master of words, and Elie a master of song. When we first meet the creator in the book of Genesis, he is depicted as a speaker and an artist. And when woman and man are first described, it is with the words, created in the image of God. The truest metaphor for the creator, as for humanity's highest calling, is the artist, the poet, the speaker, the singer, and the song. <coughs> Elie Wiesel transmitted ancient melodies he heard in Hasidic courts in Europe. He also composed songs and conducted choirs and orchestras on special occasions. Some of my favorite and most influential teachers Two of them I can think of, Jean Houston and Elie Wiesel, both said that if they weren't doing what they were doing, teaching and writing and guiding, they most wanted to be conductors. And when you think about it, in a way we're all conductors, and certainly those who can take sound and meaning and rhythm and put it all together as we conduct our lives. If not for the horror of the Shoah, he might have grown up to be both an important writer and a conductor. I remember once on a website, an antique auction, I found an old European baton, which I purchased and sent to him in New York. He sometimes began his lectures with the nigga, a hauntingly melody, a haunting melody without words. Music is my life, he said. When I write, I need music, and a very special kind. It must not be symphonic, because I cannot concentrate with symphonic music, but chamber music, or choral music, requiems, which are my favorite musical compositions. Why do I refer to him as reluctant and as a prophet? I remember when Ali Wiesel came to Vancouver more than once, and many of us heard him. This was in the early 90s, and we brought him to SFU and here at the Holocaust Education Center. I introduced him as the conscience of our generation. He later pulled me aside. He said, I am not the conscience. Everyone must have their own. And yet, years later, even President Obama called him the conscience of the world. Most prophets were reluctant. One biblical prophet, Amos, even protested, Lo navi anochi, velo ben navi anochi. I am not a prophet, nor the son of a prophet. Prophecy was not just vision, but also voice. The imperative to speak out, to act, to warn, to challenge, and ultimately to console. We must always take sides, Ellie Wiesel said, Neutrality helps the oppressor, never the victim. Silence encourages the tormentor, never the tormented. And he astutely observed that the opposite of love is not hate, it is indifference. Another Ellie Wiesel story, the story of a single letter, took place just outside this auditorium on the wall in the atrium there. It says, Kol Yisrael Aravim Zedvazed, in Hebrew letters, all Israel, every Jew, everyone is responsible for one another. And he looked at it and he said, there's one letter wrong here. It should not be a Lamed, it should be a Bet. Not everyone is responsible one to the other, meaning it's an objective uh, relationship. But the, the real statement in the Talmud is, Kol Yisrael Aravim Zedvazed, everyone is responsible one within the other, which is a subjective and intimate, a much closer relationship. 
I'd always heard it as to the other, that you have to still protect yourself. There's still a difference. I went home, I looked it up, he was right. <laughs> and uh, it's been years, and uh, uh, we still need to change the comments <laughs> on that. A few words about the art and the Zap Gallery that uh, Linda Lando put up. I purchased it from Linda, who's the, now the director of the, of the gallery here. Uh, she had for many years uh, her own gallery in Kerrisdale and then on Granville, and uh, she had the, uh, the exclusive uh, representative for Lenin's art uh, in, in this part of the world. <laughs> When uh, Linda first introduced uh, his artwork to the city, she invited his son Adam. We tried to get Leonard, but it was too difficult. So his son Adam to attend the opening. He did come, and I had a very moving talk with him. Among the subjects were how he was handling the search for his own identity when brought up under the shadow of a famous father, and also the multi-talented nature of his father. Adam half-jokingly commented, Yes, he has more than should be afforded to any one man, poet, musician, who writes the music, the lyrics, and performs his own songs, novelist, lover, and now artist. <laughs> there are over 20 pieces in the exhibit, including Leonard's own art, uh, most derived from his uh, notebooks. There are also the three posters from his three uh, concerts here in, in Vancouver in the past two years, and it's especially a one very fine photograph by the Toronto photographer originally from Europe, uh, Edward Gajdell, who was uh, hired uh, to take that photo. Here's, uh, when I saw it in uh, Hagler's books in, in Kerrisdale uh, on a, a book cover, I uh, got in touch with Random House, who published the book, and uh, was told who the uh, artist was, and then got in touch with them in, uh, in Toronto. Um, it was specially commissioned. That originally, they were supposed to, uh, Edward and his wife, who was his uh, representative, said there were going to be 50 uh, in that edition. Uh, but at that point, he had only done three. One for Leonard, one for Random House, and the third is hanging in the gallery here. And the artist waited for uh, about a year and a half until he was in the right mood and then went in, spent an entire afternoon, and produced a real masterpiece. So I hope you have a chance to look at it. This is what uh, the photographer said. This portrait of Leonard was originally commissioned for Entertainment Weekly magazine, I think in 1992. It is one of those pivotal images that had elevated my status as a photographer to new heights. The experience of making this image was equally moving in that it was a very quiet and calm session shot in my home studio, which at the time was in a beautiful old Victorian house in Toronto. Leonard pointed out subtleties of the space, which I hadn't noticed until he brought my attention to them, things like the asymmetry of the bay windows. When I peeled the 4x5 Polaroid test, I knew I had a great image. I showed it to him without saying anything, and he responded by saying that it was the best portrait he had seen of himself to date. After it ran in the magazine, for which it garnered numerous awards, Leonard bought the rights to use, to use it in his concert program and the cover of his book, Stranger Music. The Kaddish. I now invite us to recite the Kaddish, the traditional memorial prayer for the two Eliezers. Kaddish for Eliezer ben Shlomo Vesara, Professor Wiesel, Eli Wiesel, the reluctant prophet, and Kaddish for Eliezer ben Nisan, Leonard, the son of Nathan, and Masha, the singing priest, who also referred to himself in transparent honesty, mixed with self-deprecating humor as a lazy bastard in a suit, and as Jikan, the useless monk, bows his head. The one whose lyrics on You Wanted Darker paraphrased the Kaddish. Magnified, sanctified, be thy holy name, vilified, crucified in the human frame. A million candles burning for the help that never came. You wanted darker, he nanny, he nanny, 
I'm ready, my Lord. Both are no longer among us, but we remain part of them. Hallelujah, 
even before 300 other performers made Hallelujah famous with their cover versions, long before the song was included on the soundtrack for Shrek and as a staple on American Idol, Dylan recognized the beauty of its marriage of the sacred and the profane. He asked Cohen how long it took him to write. Two years, Cohen lied. <laughs> Actually, Hallelujah had taken him five years. He drafted dozens of verses and then it was years more before he settled on a final version. In several writing sessions, he found himself banging his head against the hotel room floor. Cohen told Dylan, I really like I and I, a song that appeared on Dylan's album, Infidels. How long did it take you to write that? About 15 minutes, Dylan said. <laughs> when I asked Cohen about that exchange, he said, that's just the way the cards are dealt. <laughs> I can imagine the spirit of the two Eliezers, Eli Wiesel and Leonard Cohen, together now, singing and writing and discussing, finally knowing, perhaps, the secret chord. There's a lover in the story, but the story is still the same. There's a lullaby for suffering and a paradox to blame. But it's written in the scriptures and it's not some idle claim. You want it darker? We killed the flame. He me, my lord, I'm ready. I'm ready, my lord. He me, he me, I'm ready.